Hello. Hey, did we get a good signal? I accidentally called your son at home. <laughs> hey, I got to hear him on the radio. Uh, <laughs> and she, we were listening to the show on her phone. So, Lil Mato made his internet radio debut. So. <laughs> He's like, oh, you're my dad's <laughs> friend. That's right. <laughs> 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 I don't know why that was programmed into yeah. Skype, but uh, so you're at the casino. You, you got a signal, and yeah, we're over at the RV park. That maintains itself. You're kind of cutting in and out, so stand on your I knew that toes. Gonna... <laughs> How's this? That's good. That's good. You must be on your tippy toes, okay. right? Uh, oh yeah, actually, I'm standing outside the car now. Uh, like I said, we're in the parking lot, and uh, I'll do my best for you, Kira. Okay, so your your phone is is a very basic phone. Like you couldn't live stream or whatever, right? That's what they want to do. No, they want to live stream you from the. Okay. I know they do badly, but I'll tell you what. I'll work on that this week. Uh, we're gaining more allies and supporters, and, and the resources seem to be growing. So I will, I'll talk to you as I do during the week. Okay. Yeah. It's been, on that. it's been hard because, um, you know, it seems like, it seems like people want to share and, you know, we had, I don't know if you heard about, uh, Marcus Freeho. He's a, the um, Pawnee guy from Oklahoma that live streamed his own arrest. <laughs> Did you yep. hear? Okay. Well, I'd been trying to get, um, to recruit him to revolution radio so that we could get more, more people looking at his live streams because they were fantastic. I mean, they were really, right. really good. I loved what he was doing. Um, but then after that, his page disappeared. So he's just like wiped off of Facebook since his arrest. Well, I have no idea what could have happened. But I really don't. Um, I would appreciate if information about that and share it yeah. with me uh, if you are able to. Yep. Yep. It's been going around. Well, I'll tell like you, family is sharing stuff, but Go I'll ahead. tell you, things are going great in the camp. Uh, we've got at least two thousand there right now this weekend. Um, a lot of them are just there for the weekend, but they're bringing in some much needed supplies. I was able to walk to the top of the butte above the camp earlier today, and I counted at least a half a dozen trucks bringing in firewood. And firewood is a great need; it's an everyday need. And uh, to see all that firewood being brought in was uh, was a really good site, a welcome site. Uh, other than that, the camp is well provisioned. Uh, we obviously have many supporters uh, across the world. We're aware of this in camp. Uh, people keep arriving from across the world. Earlier today, Palestinians from the uh, San Francisco Bay Area came to the camp and uh, brought a Palestinian flag. I was fortunate enough to talk briefly uh, earlier today and hope to meet with them again later tonight. Uh, I met a couple of girls from Oklahoma. They had come up to his, um, and I met uh, a friend from Washington State who drove in. You know, he's an expert when it comes to handling dogs, and he was going to start teaching our children in a good way how to treat dogs and how to handle dogs at our Lakota school uh, at the camp. Um, there are songs every night. There's actions almost every day, peaceful actions, prayerful actions. Uh, the camaraderie is, is high. Uh, we are settling into sort of a groove now. Uh, resources, as they are becoming available, are making camp life enjoyable even. Uh, every night people go around visiting, talking, sharing stories, sharing histories. Uh, we are, plans are being made for winter camp now. That is the priority for myself and, and uh, others like me who plan on uh, a winter camp. I'm not sure if you're how many of your listeners might be aware, but winters in North Dakota can be really cruel. With extended cold snaps, uh, well below zero, uh, heavy snows, blizzards. Uh, so we need to get ready for that. And we are making plans and preparations along those lines. We are waiting for some guidance from the leadership as to how to proceed, but uh, waiting on them entirely, we are making plans for improve shelters uh, uh, and uh, bathrooms of that nature. Uh, we understand that the tribe is spending about $12,000 a week in order to maintain the uh, portable bathrooms that are on site. And uh, it's well worth the money they're spending given how many people are there and given the excellent shape and condition that the outhouses are kept in. They're clean nearly daily, if not daily, and, uh, but we can start building our own structures in that regard. 
Um, that's great. That's fantastic. Uh, I, I, that's amazing about the Palestinians, um, joining. Um, uh, but I'm sure they relate to, <laughs> um, the, I'm, I'm sure they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and, you know, but, 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 you know, it's, it's everybody across the world, you know, they, they are just representatives of, of many nations and many ethnicities, you know, who, who are supporting us. Uh, come into the camp on the main road. Uh, there's well over 100 banners flying from different indigenous nations, including the Palestinian flag, might I add. And as well as, for instance, from the University of Minnesota. Uh, we see the banner from them that's signed by students uh, from the campus there. And that proudly fly, flies alongside uh, bands from like the Potawatomi Nation, uh, the Apache, Comanche. It's quite the sight to see. And, uh, you know, the pictures that I've seen online in the videos just can't do it justice. Uh, what a sight it is to see and behold that something like this was possible to happen in this country at this time. And uh, you know, I encourage everybody, as I have when I've been on with you before, uh, to come if you are able to, because the stories don't do it justice, the images don't do it justice. You have to come and actually experience this in the camp and talk to people really get the full experience of Ochete Shukoin. What is happening, what has been happening, you to happen for the foreseeable future. Um, in terms of your uh, winter provisions, and, and I did see that um, Linda Black Elk was looking for teepees and yurts and things like that. And, yes. you know, that would make a lot of sense. A yurt would be fantastic. I mean, it'd still be cool, I am, but... I am honored and proud to call in the Black Elk, uh, my sister-in-law. Uh, she's a very good relative to everyone. Uh, she has been very supportive, very helpful. Uh, the reporting that she has done on her own on her Facebook wall and other places has been accurate, true. She has debunked some of the worst rumors, and she has provided breaking news about some of the more important events. For instance, the dog attack. I first became aware of it because of a live video that Linda streamed as the attack was unfolded. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when she puts out the call, I would encourage everybody to heed Linda's words. She has put into the camp. Uh, she lives in Mowbridge, which is right next to Standing Rock across the river. Uh, she, she knows what's going on. So when, when Linda posts something, you can trust it. When she talks about the need for winter, she is absolutely right. Uh, we are in need of heavy jackets. We are in need of boots of sizes, men's and women's, waterproof, steel-toed preferably. Uh, we are in need of gloves, all sizes. Um, we are in need of long johns, all sizes, things of that nature. Uh, we, we could also uh, use additional blankets, um, and, but if... if if the person that's the person wanting to help has the means, what we could really use is extreme weather sleeping bags. Uh, that would be a, of great help. And also those small green propane canisters that can fuel uh, small cooking stoves. Uh, we are in need of those. Um, they will not distribute those to campers. Um, I believe it's a safety issue. And so they're in great need of it at the main distribution centers. So to get those small green propane canisters, Hopefully, uh, at least a few of the listeners know what I'm talking about. Yeah, we could use those directly at the camps. And then I would like to say something else too. And I think I talked about it before. If somebody really wants to help uh, support resistors. Then what I suggest is that you friend one, that you find one, a, a specific family or, or even just an individual who is there, and and get them direct aid. Uh, the, you know, there's plenty of bottled water all literally laying all over the place. They set it out, they deliver it to the, to the beach camp, to the tents, to the teepees. Uh, there, there's lots of food. Uh, well, you know, what, what, what the resistors need help with, the protectors, the defenders, is keeping their own personal lives going, their own personal financial situation. Because if you're here, it means you're not home, wherever home may be whether your home is Standing Rock or where I'm from, Cheyenne River, you know, it's a 120-mile drive for me to get back and forth from where I live. Uh, and, and others have come even greater distances than that. That's San Diego, uh, all up and down the West Coast, New York, all up and down the East Coast. You know, and, and so they're, they're away from home. They need help paying bills. They need help with gas money. Uh, if, if people can 
buy you know uh, gas stations that are common out here if they can buy gas cards and then uh, send those uh, to to campers. That's that would be of great help. That is where need is most. And uh, but if, when it comes to supplies and things like that, if if it's not winter gear, you know, just uh, if they're willing to send it, go ahead and send it. But we do need to concentrate on winter. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking in terms of those like uh, sleeping bags, those extreme weather ones. You, can you get them that like? What kind of sporting goods store or whatever is close to there that people would buy it at? Like to get a gift card or something, what would be the best place for that? Well, perhaps would be the best way to do it, actually. And uh, you know, I'm not going to go shilling for any particular companies or anything. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, some online searches, I'm sure, would produce results if somebody wanted to donate uh, a cold weather sleeping bag, an extreme sleep bag. Uh, if, if you just search online, and then of course they can always contact you, Kira. Yeah. And if they Figure need any more help or information, right? Exactly. Well, when and I you saw... are very well plugged in. Well, let me say this really quick, okay. please. Uh, blow a little smoke your way. <laughs> uh, I cannot thank you enough again for having me on the radio. I cannot thank you again enough for keeping this issue alive and well. And I know you do it every day, day and night, uh, on your own. And you're doing great work. I see that your network's expanding. Even I'm really happy for you, and the people who are becoming friends with you. I'm sure are learning just how dedicated you are. So again, uh, I'd like to say thank you for all you've done and the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. What I what I was going to say, what I did was uh, when I saw Linda's uh, status about the the teepees and the yurts, I I took. Her, um, I copied her page, and I went on to every yurt and teepee place I could find on Facebook, <laughs> and said, "Please <laughs> donate to to this contact Linda Black Elk." <laughs> I put her page up there. So, you well, know? that's really cool. So yeah, I do stuff cool. like that. Like uh, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go on Twitter and I I tweet everyone who's native. <laughs> Right. One by one on Twitter. <laughs> if you're native, you're going to get tweeted. <laughs> as long as you don't get accused of profiling, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. This it's. I've been really inspired by um, everybody who's involved. Um, just regardless of what other things are going on, I, I do respect the people who do the direct actions, and I respect the people who have been there, you know, as soon as the call was put out, they showed up. There's, there's definitely, um, you know, some differences in opinions and approaches and things. Um, but I think it's reflective of the larger culture in, in how we look at our own spirituality as, as a, as a species, you know, um, and what the young people are teaching us is that, um, you know, prayer is action. You know, action is prayer. Like that is prayer. It's not just sitting there and praying. You know, <laughs> but uh, that's prayer too. But our our actions or our prayers are, you know, what we're doing is a prayer. And that I think we're learning that from young people in in what's happening in the camps and in the actions. We talk a lot. I absolutely agree. Um... And then prayer is giving these young people the strength they need to do these actions. These actions are courageous. These actions are heroic. These actions require self-sacrifice. People are being arrested. They're they're willingly submitting themselves to a system that they know is inherently biased against them. They know this, that they're willing to be arrested by that system. They're willing to go to jail. They're willing to risk bodily harm. That's how strongly they feel about what is happening, that this side is about. You know, this isn't just a fight against uh, one pipeline. It's growing broader in scope, and, and it's a good thing. I mean, this is a fight against an entire industry that has done what it's done to the earth. You know, Kira, I've, I've shared over from the past week with several people something that I noticed, which is where Ochete Shakoe Camp is located, directly to our south, a, a, a short walk. I love walking down there, especially at night. And uh, there's the Cannonball River, a freshwater source, freshwater quotation marks. To our east is the Missouri River, uh, a huge river, one of the major rivers of the world. 
uh, a freshwater, in quotation marks, source. You have 2,000 people camped along two, one of the major rivers of the world, yet we can't draw water from it to drink. We have to import millions of gallons of water to take care of everybody. That is what's wrong. Yeah. Water is poison. The earth is already poisoned by this industry. But Chete Chacon is beginning to address the broader issues that need to be addressed. Systemic change. Not just in this country, but globally. We have to stop the paths from destroying the earth. And this is a stand against the psychopaths. This is against the stand against the oligarchs. This is a stand against the wealthy and the corporations that have used us from time beginning. And, uh, the more that come, the more that become aware of the message, I know our numbers will grow. They're already swelling. And our support on, on, on social media has been heartwarming, to say the least. It's simply incredible. Yeah. And, uh, just, we, this is, could be the beginning of major change in the world, change that's been needed ever since it got started. You know, it's always been upside down where, where power's been top down. You know, Chete Shikoni, you are self-sovereign for the most part as long as you agree to some very basic principles. You know, that you will live peacefully, you live in a good way, you won't bring weapons, you won't bring alcohol, you won't bring harsh drugs. But as long as you obey those rules, everyone's welcome there. And as long as you participate in peace and prayer, as long as you're there to support, everybody is welcome, regardless of faith, regardless of color. That's why Ocheke Shikoni can be the seed. The seed that brings global revolution. And global revolution is what's needed. Yeah. That's been being a human being for the last how many centuries. Being the, the, the tools that the the um the machine uses to steamroll over life for profit. Um it what it is is it's a big giant no. I won't be your food or I won't be your tool anymore. I will be the the, the kink. <laughs> that brings the sh- machine to a grinding halt. The monkey wrench, one of the monkey wrenches. Yeah. I like that term, monkey wrench, a lot. Yeah. I'm proud to be a monkey wrench. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you're talking about Linda being a good relative, and um, we've, we've talked about Lakota um, culture and values and but that's that's really central, isn't it, to Lakota values and culture is that the belief and the practice of we're here to learn how to be good relatives. I agree, absolutely. And Kira, a few months ago, remember, I I uh, shared something I wrote to Express Politica, the group on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And the last stanza of it is, uh, grandchild, be a good relative to who crave what is right. For our truth shall become a beacon in the descendant long dark night. And now, just you know, a few months later, here we are. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the events of the past few months have unfolded the way they have. And I do feel ancestors telling me, be a good relative. To all who pray is right. Our truth will be a beacon in this long dark night that we've been living through. You know, that these people are trying to bring it down upon us with another pipeline. You know, with another transgression against the earth and against our values. And and it's a value that the values that all humans at our core uh, have. And I think that's why it's... Or you would hope would have. <laughs> yes. And I think that that's why it's a worldwide thing is because we all understand that struggle of wanting to do the right thing when when there's a system set up to make that makes doing the right thing um have a lot of consequences that aren't fun <laughs> you know it's you're set up so you're damned if you do damned if you don't um so what do you do well, I'll tell you, earlier this week, I read a post about why I'm here. In fact, it was just a few nights ago, a couple nights ago. Because I really got to thinking about it. And uh, the reasons that brought me to what you had to and, and, and it's because I have to be here. After all I've seen in my life, after all I've experienced and all I've learned, 
about the way the world is, at least from my own narrow little worldview, I have to be here. I have no choice. Uh, you know, my mother raised me a certain way, and I wish she could have lived to have seen this. She passed uh, last November. If she could have seen this, she wouldn't have believed it. You know, I think about her often, and I was messaging with Denise, uh, to Maloney, Annie, Annie uh, May's uh, daughter, and mm-hmm. she had commented on that post. And I replied to that comment earlier today. I haven't had a chance. I finally had time today. I was on top of that butte, and I answered all the messages I could and comments that I could. But Denise in particular, I told her that I often think of my mother and hers, and I've been able to share her mother's story with people here. And that if Annie May could have seen this, she'd been really proud. You know it, Kira. Yeah. You know, this would have brought tears to her eyes because she was a true activist, a dedicated activist. And I don't think she ever imagined that our people could have come together in this way, a good way, for the purposes that we are. So I let Denise know, you know, I'm still watching us, and I feel that with us, I take. Uh, I'll always keep that with me. Always. And it, it's that commitment to getting some wind on your end there. Um, yep. it, it's Sorry, that, I'm walking against it right now. <laughs> it's that commitment to nonviolence. And a cigarette while I'm on the phone. That changes everything there. That's what we didn't have before was the, a commitment to nonviolence. Um, and it changes everything, doesn't it? It does. In fact, uh, somebody felt compelled a couple of days ago to a banner near the entrance into the camp that says we are unarmed because we are in a position where we have to announce that because of the propaganda being launched by North Dakota, by, you know, pipeline executives against us. You know, we aren't armed. I mean, unless you consider an ax for chopping wood a weapon, you know, or, or, or a personal knife. You know, I always carry a personal knife because I was raised to always have a knife. A man, a woman, you got, it's the ultimate utility. So, yeah, I got a little pocket knife. You know, if they want to call that being armed, fine. Other than that, we're not armed. There are no weapons. There is no plans to use weapons. The success we've had nonviolently has emboldened us has shown us we can do this through the power of prayer and the will to use our bodies as instruments for peace. And just we've, we've had such incredible success. I know it, that it's making them spin, you know, and their heads are spinning. They don't know how to respond. They don't know how to react. They're reacting with, with body armor. They're reacting with automatic weapons and riot gear and face shields and dogs. You know, we're, we're, we're beyond that. We're beyond all that. We're showing a different way. And the veil keeps lifting. Yes. Every time they respond like that, the veil lifts a little more. And people, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, What's what's going on here? And um, the world says this is unfair and sees it as unfair instead of uh, somehow ignoring it still. It can't be ignored any longer. It can't be ignored anymore. I agree with you totally. That's a good point. Yeah. It can't be ignored. Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm concentrating this week. Uh, I'm going to start preparing, and I've already started, a lesson about the two treaties that involve the Lakota people and the federal government of the United States. Uh, we do have two treaties, uh, one that was signed in 1851 and another one signed in 1868. But in both those treaties, the territory of the Lakota people is clearly spelled out, and they're the same in both treaties. So when people talk about, you know, this that we're on treaty land, or you know, treaties give us this and give us that, I want to give people who are willing to learn a chance to really know what they're talking about when it comes to that. So I, I am preparing this. I give it a couple places in camp, and then I'll put it up on Facebook. Oh, oh, that's uh, great. I, yeah, it's it's about you know. Uh, how the trees came about, uh, what they mean, what our country is. And I'm trying to keep it as short and sweet and possible. I'm like on my fourth now, because, uh, you know, the attention span of Facebook users, you know, about that of a third year. Right. So, but I feel people need to know this. You know, and uh, and so I'm, I'm writing it in as simple language as I can, explaining it in as good a way as I can, so that if somebody wants to, you know, or someone runs into someone who perhaps support them in the pipeline, doesn't see why 
all these Indians are in such a ruckus out in the middle of nowhere, uh, they can give one of our legal arguments. And our strongest legal argument is that we do have the Treaty of 1868, mm-hmm. which does give us, not, not give us, it recognizes our country. And uh, where El Chete Chacolian is located on right now is not on the reservation, it's off the reservation. Mm-hmm. It is on what they call Corps of Engineer land. And, uh, but that's not Corps of Engineer land. It is unceded Lakota Treaty territory. And according to the Treaty of 1868, the only way any portion of the lands within that treaty can be either sold or ceded away is with three-fourths uh, consent of the adult male population. Well, obviously, that's never happened. And so what that means also, and I want to teach people this, to get this into their thinking and get this into their conversation, is that every single act of congressional legislation or any agreement reached with any individual Lakota tribe is illegal under the Treaty of 1868. It's illegal under treaty law. It's illegal under natural law. And uh, to, to get people thinking that way and to get them to start talking that way. That Ochete Shokoni is on treaty land. I feel it is land that has been reclaimed in the name of our people and that we cannot abandon it. We have to maintain a presence north of the Cannonball River, mm-hmm. uh, which is unceded treaty territory. To go south of the Cannonball River, even for a winter camp, to me, would be a retreat in giving back the land that is rightfully ours. Mm-hmm. And now that we have this land, we need to hold it by any means necessary. And uh, I am even in contact with uh, with a couple of attorneys about land reclamation and start looking into that. And I'm, I'm right now to get the history of the river here and how we became flooded by the federal government, how the Army, Army Corps of Engineers came in and flooded the Missouri River back in the 1950s, uh, destroying one of the most beautiful you know, rivers in the world and creating five large reservoirs for hydroelectric power, irrigation, drinking water. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, to, to get those stories out and how those, all of those are all treaty violations. And we need, if we don't stand up for the treaty, nobody else is going to. That's if right. we don't insist that the treaty be honored, nobody else will. It's up to us to do it. And we are fortunate that we have many now, many, many educated Lakota who, who can speak in their language, who can write in their language, who can go into their courts and, and their legislatures and wage these battles for us and to, and, and to get this issue going and to keep it alive and finally do justice, however long that might take. Right. Yeah, because right now the the sovereignty is, 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 is it's on paper but it's still not in reality yet um, because it's on the paper, but it's not being, you know, enforced. I don't know. That's not even the right word. Like honored. I guess honored is the right word then. Um, None of it is being honored. And there's a lot of misunderstandings about um, what treaties are and what they mean. And, um, you know, the difference between what unseated, uh, land means and how, I mean, there's a story now going on about the Army Corps of Engineers has given special permits for the camps there now. Um, and I think they're doing things like that because they, they're not, they shouldn't legally have that land anyway to begin with. So they want to take the attention from that and put it into, well, we've given them special permits because we're nice, you know. And it helps diffuse a potential powder keg, which is right. how many people are present and ordering them out of there and forcing a confrontation on those grounds. I think they're, you know, heedful of that. And they recognize how many people down there are truly committed to this. Mm-hmm. And that uh, when it comes to a trip to it is going to take a lot of talk and a lot of understanding. And ultimately, it's going to take them understanding that we're not giving it back. And, uh, once they understand that, I think we'll get along fine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that they do as well. Uh, what What are some of the um, myths that you would like to dispel? Um, not, not just the Army Corps of Engineers well, and stuff, but what are some of the other myths that are... Central. Well, I'll tell you, the, the, big one, the big one continues to be that, that and, and I think you alluded to it earlier when uh, we were listening to the show on the, on the phone, was uh, that there's jamming of signals going on. 
There's not. I mean, we are in an area where there are not a whole lot of cell towers available. And from what I understand, Standing Rock has their own wireless service. So I understand why, you know, the lack of towers from other providers there because they have their own service to provide. And uh, if you want quality wireless here, then and you should get it from the people who offer it to you, and that's that's toxic. But, but other than that, you know, uh, I've heard wild claims about governments, you know, jam. Speak to any of that here, except I know that I get texts literally down. I can't have any internet access. I can't hit with a slew of notifications from Facebook when some 3G frees up for me and my and it comes in with the tower to let it know where it's at. And that's all. Um, uh, you're breaking up a little bit. What's that? You're breaking up a little bit there. How's that? That's good. That's good. Okay. There's a mobile command center that the Federal Police Bureau of Indian Affairs had on site at the casino. That's been gone for some time now. I didn't even notice when that left. And uh, the police are, are very helpful. They are, uh, non, they are non-presence in camp. Uh, I don't believe that jurisdiction there was probably the primary reason, but even so on the road, they're smiling, they're helpful. I'm talking about the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, you know, it's just, uh, there's not that type of, uh, we're not dealing with that type of oppression right now. We're not. The oppression doesn't start till you go north, till you get towards Bismarck and Mandan and their roadblocks and, you know, the hostility that exists in those communities right now over this fight towards Indian people. Yeah, um, I was reading an article the other day where they were um, interviewing the neighbors, and one of the guys was like, when you get that many Indians together, is it safe? <laughs> like, it's like, um, <laughs> seriously? Like, when you get, I mean, when you get that many white people together, is it safe? Um, you wouldn't think well, about saying something like that, you know? Shit. No, of course not. Of course not. It just goes into his, his privileged way of thinking, you know, his, his cocooned way of thinking. Yeah. They live in, Bill Mark calls it, and they really do. And what goes on outside the bubble is of no consequence to them. So, and then, they, you know, if they wanted to find out for sure, all they'd have to come down and they'd be greeted as relatives right at the gate. You know, they'd be, they, they, they'd been running a can of such, you know, uh, either cedar or sage present there and and they greeted with smiling faces, and if any questions, they'd be answered right there by our security, and they'd be guided to where they needed to go. You know, it's just the local people would just take the time to find out what we're about. You know, they find out that they're welcome. To where, uh, and they should be are. interested in what you're doing, too, because they will be affected by that pipeline adversely as well. So Yeah. Well, that's interesting, though, because remember... Uh, Bismarck Mandan did manage to get the site on East Missouri relocated yeah. from the original plan. The original plan was 10 miles upriver from that Bismarck Mandan. When they learned, they, it, they didn't have to fight it. They just got it moved right to the tip of Standing Rock. Go figure how that happened. Yeah. And so they knew, they knew the potential there. They knew the threat. They knew the danger. And, uh, you know, that they're, they're comfortably safe and, upriver from this pipeline. It's mm-hmm. easy for them to oppose. Ah, to, to, to say, oh, how dare they be upset, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then I've heard exactly. um, the other uh, justification is like, well, there's already pipelines going through there, so we should put more? <laughs> so we should yeah, I know. put more danger <laughs> there? I mean, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. And uh, and and the, the other thing is, is that people, I don't think, Non-Indians really understand the full history of uh, native land just being like a constant dumping ground and, you know, your uranium mining going on, uh, toxic dumping just for forever. You know, that's been the plan of the government is just let's dump it on the reservations or right at the edge. You know, I mean, uh, since since the uh, the smallpox blankets, that's how it's been. Right. And absolutely. So, um, I don't think people really realize the full, I mean, cancer rates and things like that are through the roof on reservations because of that. Um, no regard for the drinking water um, whatsoever. It's like Flint times 10 on steroids um, in many areas. 
and many different reservations. So um, there's a long history of um, our, our young people that are um, willing to say no. They're saying no to all the all of that, not just what's happening now. They're saying no to all of it. No. That they are. And uh, and it is, it is the young people saying no to it because I think they've got a lot more information available to them these days, and we know they do. Mm-hmm. And uh, they are picking up the vocabulary of what's wrong, and here's specifically what's wrong. Here's what's wrong with this pipeline. Here's what's wrong with this nuclear reactor. Here's what's wrong with this coal mine, this uranium mine. Uh, you know, they're getting better educated. Social media certainly is enabling that. Shows like yours are invaluable tools to help spread information, to help spread awareness and knowledge. And as as your show grows, and I know your show is growing, and I'm so proud and happy for you, I can't even tell you. Uh, the more people find out, naturally, this is going to grow because people are going to realize they have a vested interest in this fight. If you have a child, if you have a grandchild, if you have people you love, if you care about the water you drink, this is your fight. You know, there are 18 million people, nearly 18 million, that draw their drinking water from the Missouri River. There should be 18 million people or nearly 18 million people protesting, you know, protesting this pipeline, protecting the water, defending the land. You know, we have to keep getting the message out and, and never stop. You know, all your listeners who are on social media, please, you know, post every day, post, share, comment, uh, post uh, information at media sites, the major media sites. Keep the pressure on, keep the pressure up. This is just the beginning. This is nowhere near ending. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and we, we've got to stay committed. We've got to stay dedicated. And I know, I know we will. I know huge numbers, millions now will. Yeah, more people are learning. You know, let CNN let them ignore us. We have our own media, part of our own media. You're on other shows. You know, the, 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 you're getting the message. Unicorn Riot, you know, the, the little band of renegades there, and the work they're doing, getting the story out to people across the world. You know, that media. You know, let let the old people and the conservatives have the mainstream media. We don't need it, and yep. I personally don't want it. You know, if I saw them down there, I would not go and think, oh, great. You know, we're going to get the top of the news to clock and be the best of the line. And I'd be, I'd be instantly, it could be, how are they going to distort the story? Yep. You know, and how are they going to portray us? Because seeing how the local media has treated us, and it's not been balanced, it's not been fair. It's true. Yeah, any last thoughts? We're about to uh, wrap it up here. Come to a shift issue if you can. Support any way you can. I want to thank each and every listener who has done something to help support the camp, even if it is a simple share. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody. And, uh, I wish peace to everybody listening, and I hope to be able to talk with everybody again soon. Thank you so much for joining us, and um, thank you for what you're doing. I know it's not easy, uh, and we're, we support you. 100%. Well, it, make, it makes it a lot easier thanks to people like you and many of your listeners. It really does. Thanks again. Okay. So, it's Tuesday morning after the show, and uh, I'm just going to do a little wrap-up here while I walk the dogs. <laughs> Multitasking. Um, yeah, so... We heard from John McGuire, and um, it was great to talk to him after almost two years, and uh, so much has changed over the past two years um, in our second year of Yellow Thunder Food Sovereignty, and we really focused this year on pollinator health and creating healthy habitat for our pollinators right here on our six acres. And that's been very successful. The um, the hummingbirds are still here. It's the 20th of September. Um, They'll be here. Well, there'll be travelers coming through until October sometimes even mid-October. Um, the, the birds come down from Canada and on their way south to come through here. This is a major migratory path um, 
first thing I saw this morning when I walked out was the great blue heron, which is an impressive bird. Uh, the wingspan is almost almost that of an eagle. Very, very impressive. So I'm approaching the creek and and um, fall has begun. The leaves are starting to turn. All the goldenrod is out. And um, fall is upon us. The cues. Pretty soon, I guess, we'll have that uh, daylight savings thing or whatever. And we'll get all confused and disoriented again. So the folks at uh, in Cannonball are preparing for winter camp. Well, winter camp is going to be really intense this year, and uh, I hope that everyone is well provisioned. I do know that I saw an announcement that uh, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard had made about the funds that Sacred Stone has collected so far. I think it's about $688,000. Um, and I'm, I'm unsure why that could not pro provide enough Arctic sleeping bags for everyone there. But I don't know what other expenses they have. I know that they're, you know, that's a lot of people. A lot of people are staying there. So, um, but I think anybody who is willing to winter camp in North Dakota to stop this pipeline should be given an Arctic sleeping bag. It's just kind of one of my thoughts there about that. Um, <clears throat> I've been seeing a lot of uh, Peltier stuff get uh, spread around and old AIM stuff during this and um, it's disturbing. It's disturbing. It really, really is. Um, and I think people should really, really look into um, Peltier's story before they go pronouncing him innocent. And, um, you know, he's not going anywhere until he tells the truth. That's the thing. He's told so many different stories. Um, you know, it's like, which one do you believe? The one you want to believe. You know, if you're a free Peltier person, you're just believing what you want to believe. You actually haven't looked into it at all. Um, that's my feeling about that. Um, and the, and the, the Dennis Banks rhetoric that's out there, it's a good day to die. Well, that bullshit needs to die. Because it's extremely tone deaf. In the middle of a youth suicide uh, emergency that Indian country is in. A veteran suicide emergency that we're facing. But it's a good day to die? Screw you, Dennis Banks. That's what I say. You're still living. So, um, those are my thoughts about that. Uh... I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone else about, um, you know, sharing things without really, really looking into it. And I've um, committed myself to being better about that. Um, it's Sometimes we just see something and we like the, the headline and we want to save it for later and we might just, you know, share it. And it might be totally untrue. It might be satire. It might be um, propaganda. Um, might be all of the above. <laughs> Who knows? But, um, for myself, I've kind of recommitted to, to researching what I share. Um, especially in light of all this, you know, let's bring P Peltier back up again while we have, um, you know, while we have all this juice behind this movement. Um, Another thing I would like you to consider if you're, you know, a free Peltier person is um, a lot of money has been collected by um, the Leonard Peltier
committee, free Leonard Peltier committee, um, and none of that money has actually freed him. So every few years or so, they have a concert or some sort of fundraising, and the money goes to lawyers. Lawyers who not only have never gotten him even close to being out of jail, but who never will. <sighs> never will. He's not going anywhere. No matter how many memes you share on Facebook, um, and no matter how many fundraisers go to pay the newest batch of lawyers who won't do a damn thing for him. Why? I mean, he's probably too scared to tell the truth, but maybe he doesn't even know what the truth is at this point, 40 years later. People tell themselves lies, you know. Um, but most likely, he's too scared to tell the truth. Because it's ugly. But I don't know him, and I don't, you know, I know that he's very ill. Um, and certainly his human rights shouldn't be violated for any reason. Um, regardless of whatever human rights he's violated um, over the years. Uh, and I'd also like to say, you know, this... I, I spout off a lot of anti-AIM rhetoric... Um, but I'm, I'm actually all for the things that AIM says they're for. I'm all for that. But I've seen too much evidence, in, personally, not just the research that I've done, but personally, um, that the stated goals of AIM are, aren't really their goals. <laughs> and, um, there's two things going on here. One, um... There's a lot of different AIM chapters, and they all have their individual goals and things like that. Um, and they all follow different leaders. There's that. Um, but the reality is, the only time I've ever had my life threatened, it's been by an AIM member. Um, so that's just the reality that I... Um, face, look at, deal with, no. I don't care who you are, the truth is more important. I think one of the other things that one of the other things that's going on is um, basically the liberal mindset says the Indians got screwed over, so therefore they're not all bad like the propaganda of the past has insisted. They're all good. Every Indian is good, rather than. Every Indian is an individual, just like anybody else. See the difference? It's dehumanizing, actually, either way. Whether you're good by virtue of being an Indian or bad, it's dehumanizing. So that's something for people to look at in themselves. So I hope you all have a good day, good evening, I'm off to work, day job, thanks for listening.